here. Did you set up with the mic? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Put the outside. Is it okay if I put that inside or is that bad? I think it's easier. If, like you can try putting on your badge. Okay. I can move my badge up a little if necessary. Testing, 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 testing. It's on. Okay, good. Do you have uh, I think I'll be okay. Yeah. Oh, you're right. I should put it over there. <laughs> Point. So, we do have a laser pointer. Okay, cool. Um, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Hey, good. How's it going? Good. Yeah, I think so. Morning. It's going to be William Stein. He's going to tell us how we're going to do dynamics with SAGE. Okay. Um, but I'll talk about doing mathematical research using SAGE, and um, hopefully, given that dynamics is mathematical research, um, it'll fall under what I'll talk about. Um, so first, what I'm going to do is give really a brief overview and background about SAGE, and uh, talk a little bit about SAGE in the context of doing research mathematics, and then show you some examples. I've um, very much underprepared the talk regarding number of slides and content, so it would be very helpful for me if you stop me at any time and ask questions. Um, I'll make sure to keep my eyes out so I can see if anybody has their hand up. So if you feel like asking a question, just go for it. It will help me a lot. Um, so abstract, as I just said. So here are the mission statements, by the way, for um, ISERM and the SAGE project. Um, ISERM has a very long mission statement, but inside of it it says to expand the use of computational methods in mathematics. So that's at least a connection with uh, SAGE. The goal of the SAGE project is uh, pretty short, but kind of defined by some of the words in the project. Create a viable, free, open source alternative to Magma, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB. And um, a, a difference between the two mission statements is that though SAGE is, is very short, it's very much subject to interpretation and it's relative to the reader. Um, what a viable alternative to uh, MATLAB is for you is completely different than what it is for you, and certainly for me, since I never use MATLAB. But for me, a big part of the mission statement is a viable alternative to MAGMA, which does provide an enormous amount of functionality that's relevant to my research. So what does this mean? A little more details about the um, goal of the SAGE project. Uh, so there it is, the mission statement again at the top. But what does that mean? Roughly speaking, it means to have similar mathematical functionality to these other systems with comparable speed. So uh, it's not good enough if we can factor integers, but you know it just uses trial division, uh, whereas another system implements a quadratic sieve or a number field sieve or something like that. It's really important that you have similar performance. Um, likewise, with many other algorithms and elliptic curves, linear algebra, et cetera, uh, that's a big part of it. So we want both similar functionality to all four of these systems combined with speed. I make no claim that SAGE has completely uh, satisfied its mission statement today. I think it's far from doing so. There are certain specific instances where it is doing very well, but there are many others where it's not. But that's what the um, goal is, to be clear. Um, graphics, so um, some of these systems don't have very good graphics like Magma, but others do. And so having good 2D and 3D visualization capabilities is one of the core things that SAGE really needs to do. Um, and there we've done quite a lot. We've benefited a huge amount from um, people in applied mathematics, numerical computing, and scientific computing, who have provided a lot of free and open source tools for um, scientific uh, visualization type applications which we've adapted for mathematics. Um, another important feature of SAGE is that it has a notebook interface in addition to 
a command line interface. Um, in other words, something where you can interactively input code, see the output, uh, type set mathematics, draw pictures, and have it all appear in one single document. In fact, this talk that I'm giving you is inside of the interactive Sage notebook. So for example, here there are these little cells, and if you type something like 2 plus 3, and then hit shift enter, it evaluates that code right there. And you can uh, go back and change what you just did, so using the up arrow, and do something else. So you can do little things like this. And you can also draw images, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another important feature of all of the MAs, uh, definitely all four of them have a huge amount of literature associated with them. There are many books, um, say for calculus teaching, that have examples in Mathematica. There are uh, many, many articles that illustrate various areas of research in mathematics using Magma. I've written maybe, I don't know, a lot of articles uh, doing that. So another important part of SAGE is that it should have similarly many publications that use it. And if, to give you a sense of how that's going, um, we do keep track of the publications that use SAGE at this website right here. So this is a list of articles that uh, reference SAGE and the, the authors were proud of this fact, so they sent us an email and said, please uh, put us on your website. So we have a little database of these. These are all actually published articles. Then there are PhD theses that uh, use SAGE, and then there are um, books, and finally preprints, which haven't appeared yet. So we keep those in a separate category. We also have something at the bottom, which is about how to cite SAGE. Um, as you'll see in a moment, SAGE, uh, though there is an uh, enormous amount of new code that's been written by many hundreds of people, there's also an even more enormous amount of code that SAGE packages from other um, software development projects. And we encourage people to, when they use SAGE, to do something. For example, if you compute the rank of an elliptic curve, you might want to figure out what software is being used behind the scenes to do that calculation and acknowledge um, that author as well, or that program as well. So there's a discussion here about how to cite SAGE, um, what to do if you, um, et cetera. There's a BibTeX reference right here if you want to know how to put it in your bibliography, et cetera. So um, that's just a little snapshot of how we're going. Of course. You know, you can, if you look at mathematical software that's been around for decades, you'll find far more than 165 references to uh, many of the systems, like Macaulay 2 or Magma certainly has more references. But Sage is relatively new and only really got stable enough to use a couple of years ago. Um, here's some reasons, mainly uh, personal to me, why I don't like using Magma, Maple, MATLAB, and Mathematica. In other words, why I'm motivated to put an enormous amount of effort into Sage, why I don't just sort of give up and go home. Um, and you may have no reasons at all, in which case uh, you might just use Sage for its technical um, advantages. It does do some unique things that are not done by any of the other systems. But for me personally, these are some of the issues that have motivated me over the years to work on Sage. Well, to start the Sage project in the first place and really continue with it and uh, put, make a lot of sacrifices and put a lot of effort into it. So um, one issue which is sort of obvious with the MAs is that they cost money. Um, and they're not, I mean, they're really pretty expensive, actually. Um, their list prices are over $1,000 in all cases. And even in third world countries, the discounts aren't so good. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, another issue that can be frustrating, depending on your um, perspective on doing computational math, is that the details of implementations and algorithms are, in many cases, secret. They are what give that particular piece of software a competitive advantage in the marketplace. And um, there's a natural motivation by the purveyors of that software to not tell you precisely how they implemented an algorithm to compute, say, the Hermit normal form of a matrix. Because if they do, they won't be able to continue um, bragging that their software is you know, a million times faster than everybody else's and uh, providing that sort of unique advantage. So um, that, there, there are many, many implementations of really interesting and exciting algorithms where you can't read them. And this can get very frustrating if you are doing research related to those algorithms. And you find that if you could just modify something somewhat, then you'd be in good shape. Um, with Magma, at least, they work somewhat with the academic community. And so if you just start developing with them, you can often get access to what's going on internally. Um, but it's still kind of an uh, unpleasant situation in the long run. Um, another issue is that the control of development for all of these systems is very tight, and it's hard to know exactly why design decisions are made. Um, with Sage, on the other hand, for most design decisions and uh, 
almost everything that happens is done very publicly. So if we decide to make a major change, there's almost always a vote on a public mailing list, a big discussion. Often 50, 100 messages will go back and forth, and everything is archived. Also, for every single piece of code that goes into Sage, um, there's a referee process where the person says, I'd like this code to go into Sage. Somebody else or several other people will look at that code and give feedback on it. And with very, very high probability, just like with a research paper, uh, the initial code submission will not get into Sage as is. I mean, the probability is like almost zero that code that you submit will get into Sage as is. Everybody, I mean, how many, how many papers have you published where the referee didn't have even a single suggestion? Has anybody ever done that? Wow, impressive. Ken Rivet once showed me a paper that Nick Katz wrote where he did that, which was very impressive, but it's pretty unusual. Um, and likewise with Sage, and any, you know, any software, it's just the case that you should expect that this will happen. But the one funny thing with Sage is that, or the one different thing with Sage is that all of the refereeing is completely public. So when you post your code up, it's posted for all to see. All the commentary on it is public and archived forever, and the referee is not anonymous. So everything's just completely out there. Uh, this is a little bit different, though it's possible if you uh, read uh, Tim Gower's recent blogs that maybe mathematics publications will in some cases be refereed that way. Uh, he was definitely suggesting that one might want to consider doing this. And there are some referees that like to do this. I don't know. But with uh, code, it seems to be a good idea, uh, or at least with an open source project. So that's another issue. Um, copy protection, that's sort of a no-brainer. It can be really annoying if you try to start Mathematica and it doesn't work because your license expired. Or you want to run it on a whole bunch of computers, or you buy a new laptop and you're all excited to set up your new software and you have to wait for license codes and you know, get, get new um, things so that you can use your software. Or you, know, you change your network and there's something funny about the network and suddenly Maple doesn't work. That sort of thing, all these things have happened to me and probably to you. Um, another issue that is, uh, you may or may not have thought about is that uh, all four of those systems have made up their own programming languages. And so you're kind of locked into the system in a stronger way than you are at least with Sage because you have to write in their particular language and you develop all your code in that language in the mathematical language or the maple language or the uh, magma language. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a vendor lock-in and it also has disadvantages as far as uh, the number of people working on improving and designing that language. With Sage, the language that we use is just one of the, it's basically the most popular scripting language that looks somewhat like Magma. It's Python, which um, looks a lot like Magma if you're gonna look at a popular scripting language. Um, it's developed completely separately from Sage and uh, often if you say are teaching an undergrad course or something and just do a survey of languages that the students know, um, depending on where you are, they're very likely to maybe know Java they're very likely to have some experience with Python, and you know, they'll know a little bit of JavaScript. But they probably, they, they're much less likely to know Mathematica or Magma or something like that. Because um, people use Python in a lot of contexts outside of mathematics. And even uh, it, within mathematics, there are a couple of different libraries for doing mathematical stuff in Python. So you could be a big Python user, use Sage a lot, and then decide you don't like Sage at all, but you could still continue using Python to do mathematics. Although we do include all, pretty much all the other math libraries that are written in Python. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, another issue is bug tracking is usually secret. This might make you feel good because you can't find a big list of known bugs in your software. But um, with Sage, we do make that all completely public. So if you want to you know, go and five, 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 you know, find several hundred bugs in Sage listed publicly, it's not difficult to do because we list them for everyone to see. Um, usually the bugs are in, uh, not, you know, given this input, you get a completely wrong mathematical output. Uh, usually there are things like something crashes, something isn't implemented, the semantics are confusing, um, et cetera, et cetera. The graphical interface does something funny, uh, et cetera. But it, it seems to me that it would be best if bug tracking is public. And one other thing, Sage has a pretty good compiler, which will turn the Python code that you would write for Sage into a compiled form that's very fast, where you can declare types. So if you want to write code at a similar speed to C, you can do that in a pretty straightforward manner in, in Sage. We have very, very good support for that. It's something that um, it didn't, it was sort of at its very infancy when I chose Python as the language for Sage, but I pushed very hard via funding students, um, NSF funding, et cetera, to greatly improve the compiler that one has for Python called Cython. So now it's in pretty good shape. It's actually used enormously by the the miracle and scientific computing community that uses Python. 
I went to a scientific um, computing museum Python conference in Paris uh, about a year and a half ago, and almost every other talk mentioned the Python compiler, which was something that we put a lot of effort into. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why I personally would like to have an alternative to these MAs. Skip that. Um, and now I'm just going to summarize what SAGE is, say a little bit about doing math research using SAGE, and then try harder to encourage questions. So, and show you some examples. So, just kind of summarizing what SAGE is, um, it's a couple of different things. One is it uses a, a, the language Python, and it's a big Python library. It's about a million lines of code written in Python um, by people during the last five or six years. Uh, there's a whole bunch of packages of code written by many people in this room that is included with Sage. So when you get Sage, you get this complete self-contained distribution, which includes uh, a wide range of code. Um, Michael Stoll's right there has written a substantial chunk of it. Even if you never use Sage, a lot of the code he's spent a lot of time writing is in Sage, like rap points, for example. Um, there are, there are these things called interfaces, which allow you to use Mathematica, Magma, Maple, etc., all from within Sage, um, Gap, etc., uh, Maxima. So originally the interfaces were written to make it a little easier to implement Sage, um, but they are kind of a unique feature. Uh, because Sage is built out of other components, we had to write and then really, really, really optimize and make work well and practice interfaces to these other computer algebra systems. So for example, we have two interfaces to Maxima. Um, one of them uses a pseudo TTY and the other uses a C library. We, um, so Maxima, which is a list-based computer algebra system going back to the 60s, um, we include in Sage something called ECL, Embedded Common Lisp, which is an implementation in C of the Lisp language that you can link into a C program. Python itself is a C program. And so you can, so what happens under the hood is that um, for symbolic computation, like symbolic integration and differentiation and so on, um, Sage, via a C library interface, uses Maxima. And strangely enough, the guy that wrote most of the C library interface to Maxima is Niels Bruyn, who you might know from arithmetic dynamics because he's a number theorist. But in his spare time, he does a lot of uh, list packing and stuff for Sage. Um, and there's this new library that I mentioned before. There's lots of code, some of it novel. Um, it's well over a half million lines of code. And there are Probably around 500 people have contributed to this at this point. Many undergraduates, grad students, and, and so on. Here's a picture that just one single kind of snapshot of what Sage is. It's not comprehensive in that, um, in e I, for example, I have a little bubble here which says CC++ libraries that are included in Sage, but this, these are not all the libraries, it's just some of them. Um, maybe I'll make this bigger for a moment. See that, but you can think of Sage as being a combination of Singular, Maxima, Gap, Peri, Python, a whole bunch of different libraries that um, are written for Python mainly by the scientific computing community, which is much you know, bigger than the pure math research community at computation. Um, and then there's tons of low level libraries uh, like NTL and, and MPIR and MPFR and MPC and so on, they're all included here in Sage. So that's what, that's what Sage is. It's all this stuff put together in a way that kind of builds in a coherent, self-contained manner. And then on top of that, we have um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of new code that kind of assembles this together and provides, um, fills in the gaps in functionality, which are uh, extremely extensive. If you're used to using, say, Magma, like I was, and you suddenly um, want to use just open source free software, you'll discover that there are vast, vast you know, landscapes of algorithms that just aren't implemented at all, or their implementations are really, really slow. And so you end up having to write lots of new code. Um, but on the other hand, there, there are many cases where lots and lots of really important basic algorithms are implemented, and the implementations are superb. Um, Peri provides an enormous number of really good implementations of certain things. And uh, Sage just directly uses that stuff at uh, C-level speed. Um, here's a little picture that shows that Sage is a very international project. So there's um, hundreds and hundreds of people with accounts on our, our bug development server. And out of all these hundreds of people, we actually know where um, nearly 200 of them are. And that we write them emails and ask, you know, do you mind if we put your name on the map and where are you and so on. So this just gives you a sense of the global um, nature of Sage. There's a dot for each developer who's identified their location. 
And so it's uh, in most major places. But one important thing is that there's lots and lots of dots in Europe in addition to the United States. Um, Sage is pretty popular in Europe as well. Okay, and the last uh, slide before I just encourage questions and show you examples is a quick history. So um, I released the very first version of the project in February 2005, and then one year later I released version 1.0 at the first Sage Days workshop. We were planning to have one workshop per year, but we ended up having one more that year. And then the following year we ended up having uh, four workshops, and uh, various things happened, so for example, in 2007, we won some, some prize in France called the Trophies de Libre, uh, some sort of free software trophy, and this gained us a lot of publicity and helped with funding. So for example, after we won this, I got an email from um, Chris de Bono, who's the head of open source software research or something at Google, saying, I'd like to give you some money for Sage. I mean, it just sort of happened as a result of publicity from this. And so he gave us some money, and that was really helpful. Um, and NSF has, of course, started funding SAGE in some degree at that time. Um, we had more SAGE Days workshops, so lots and lots, seven or eight, so one every other month. 2009, we had even more. We started getting, in 2009, we got 3D graphics, which, um, and uh, better interactive functionality, so you can make little graphical user interfaces in the SAGE notebook, so you have little widgets and sliders and stuff. 3D graphics and graphical interfaces for illustrating things in the notebook may not sound super important for research, but they are for teaching. And getting um, SAGE used by teachers results in, for example, different opportunities for NSF grants and a uh, much wider range of potential users. Um, and we did get a, a pretty nice grant from the NSF called Utmost. It's a type two CCLI grant. And uh, that is really because we have all kinds of support for undergrad education type stuff. Um, so in 2010, we had 13 SAGE days. In 2011, we had 12 of them. So we're having a workshop uh, every month. In 2012, we already have 14 that are planned. So um, there's one going on right now in Seattle that I was just at. Um, I'm missing the second half of it. Um, but there's tons, and they're all over the world. Um, and I'm obviously not going to all of them. In fact, I'm not even invited to all of them. Because I don't even know about some, some of them. But. Um, but they are listed on the SAGE website. So if you go to sagemath.org, which is the website for SAGE development, or well, for everything related to SAGE, oh, wait. Um, there is something called the wiki. And in the wiki, you find a link to SAGE days. And here they are. These are upcoming workshops. So this is the one that's going on right now. And you can see there's. Um, going to be another one at UW about improving the documentation of SAGE. Um, there's a lot of work that could be done. Um, there's going to be one in Korea, another one in Montreal, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one aspect of most of these workshops is that, like an ISERM workshop, you get your expenses reimbursed. So um, we, in almost every case, we're able to fly the people in and pay for their hotels and so on um, via grants. So. Um, you might not expect that, but that's the case in almost all situations. Very much thanks to the NSF, and in some cases, private donations, donations from Microsoft, Google, etc. Okay, so that, is, that, that pretty much ends the kind of introduction. And I wanted to say a little bit about SAGE and mathematical research. So before I go too far, let me um, just say some things. So um, the, basically, uh, there's this sort of idea that is going around called reproducible research, which um, is maybe connected to this. I'll say a little bit about that in a second. But the idea of this is just that I want to encourage you to um, turn your sort of scruffy research code that you wrote and ran in the course of writing a paper um, or doing some project into something that gets included in SAGE itself. Um, I mean, that's, that's the short of it. And this may sound like it should be easy, right? Just send me your code. Um, but of course, if you look at your code, you might feel like you don't want to do that because maybe it's not documented at all, or it's kind of embarrassing, or uh, it's just a total mess, or you can't even remember how it works. Um, of course, you wouldn't admit to any of that, but I will. Um, typically, when I write code, that's the case. Um, if I just play around with some code, it, you know, it's a mess. It's uh, not well documented, not well organized. I may have changed the code halfway through running some calculations, 
Um, I may have changed it to fix some bug, which makes it impossible to run the same code um, on earlier parts of my calculation, um, et cetera. There are all kinds of issues that may arise. And I probably didn't write really good documentation for every spec of my code. Um, but if you, you never know. I mean, you may write, you may be working on five different projects, and one of them turns into something that you're definitely going to publish a nice paper about, and it does rely on calculations. Um, if you're, I would strongly encourage you to take that code and really polish it up. And with Sage, there's a really well-defined notion of polishing the code up and doing things right and making the code available to others. Um, first, we have something called the Sage Developer's Guide, which is pretty um, detailed. Here it is. Welcome to the Sage Developer's Guide. And it tells you how to include your code in Sage. You take any copy of Sage at all, you follow these directions, and it explains how to include your code and submit it as a patch or a sequence of patches to the Sage track server. It also talks about the um, format that your code should take, um, what sort of uh, requirements we have for code to be included with Sage. There's kind of a checklist. For example, each time you introduce a function, you have to give an example that illustrates how that function works. If your function has three or four different inputs, you should illustrate all of them and discuss why they're doing various things, maybe give examples of corner cases, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't do that, your code will, just, it will not get accepted into Sage. You have, you'll be asked to do that. So there's lots of little things like that. Um, so basically, I would like to encourage people to do that. But having done it myself, even where you know, for me, it should be I should be the person for which is the easiest. And in many cases, when I write papers, I find this to be as hard as writing the paper, um, or harder. It's really, really hard work to go from some code that seems to work to code that's really fully documented and up to the standards that somebody else would sign off on in my experience. I don't know what your experience is, but that's my experience. Um, but if you think about it, there aren't really that many outlets for doing this where people will peer review your code. Uh, the other, one other option is contributing your code to Magma, but even then, I don't think their peer review process is really um, at least as well defined as ours. And I mean, I've, I don't know what it's like now. I submitted about 30,000 lines of code to Magma, and Usually, um, somebody looks it over, but they don't necessarily have any understanding of the mathematics. Usually, they don't. And so when they look it over, they just make, you know, like, it's kind of like the analog of um, adding commas or something, or deleting them. Um, but that could depend a lot on the, the area. But with Sage, we have so many people involved that usually you can find somebody else with mathematical knowledge that can really give you feedback on your code. OK, here's an example, by the way, of, um, so exactly a year ago, I was at an Arizona winter school where Henri Darmon and uh, Victor Rodger were talking about Chow Higner points, and I thought of a way to compute them that was totally different than the description they were giving. Chow Higner points are kind of like Higner points, they're points on elliptic curves that you get via a certain construction. And basically, you take a point on one curve, pull it back to a modular curve, and push it forward and add it up. And that gives you um, a point on the other elliptic curve. So I thought of a way to compute them, and then I posted my code here. And I uh, did that a couple of months ago. And now you can read all the refereeing. So John Cremona um, decided to referee it. And he makes some remarks. He makes more remarks. He makes more remarks. He's finally reviewing it. He notices some little issues. Um, and at one point, he says, your test of gamma 0 and equivalence is very clever. But I don't quite understand it. Um, so this test of gamma 0 and equivalence, um, Samit Dasgupta suggested it to me. So you have two points in the upper half plane, and you want to know whether or not they're equivalent, modulo the action of gamma zero of it. So I put in a very nice, wonderful, quick, easy way of doing that, um, that Samit Dasgupta sort of suggested to me when I gave a talk about this at Santa Cruz in October. And I was, you know, I was convinced it was right, but if Cremona was like, oh, I don't think so. So I sent him an email with the proof. And uh, somewhere else, I don't know if he mentions it here, but he was having breakfast with Boss Eriksson and mentioned it to Boss, and Boss was like, no, that's completely wrong. Um, you're completely neglecting that um, the model you're using for this modular curve is singular, highly singular. And here's a counterexample. And so John sent me explicit examples um, somewhere in here where the code is, where the algorithm is just wrong. So I implemented another algorithm. So these are the explicit examples that show that the gamma zero of an equivalence checking in the paper and in my code is completely wrong um, in a special case. And so then he continued the review. I fixed the code. Um, mathematically, at some point, he becomes completely happy with everything. And then uh, the sort of computer-y people start testing it on Red Hat Enterprise Linux on uh, Itanium 64-bit. 
So, you know, who runs Itanium? Does anybody here run Itaniums? Well, Sage gets tested on a lot of platforms, and we have a couple of Itanium machines that we tested on. And they are useful to test it on because, you know, there's slightly different architecture um, under the hood, and they might review numerical, they might, you know, it, apparently it's revealing some issue with the SL2Z equivalency checking, which is important to get to the bottom of. So, I mean, this is supposed to be done using interval arithmetic. I must have made a mistake somewhere. So that's the sort of thing that can happen in refereeing the code. And of course, when you know John and Basidik seven pointed out this mistake, I went back and fixed the paper, um, and I think it got sent to the referee. It was already submitted, but it was fixed. This so is just an example of the sort of thing that happens. And you might be dying to know what the code looks like, or what code looks like for that matter. Um, so if I click on patch, that's here's what Sage code looks like. Um, it's Python code, so. Okay, so now that is everything that I wanted to say. Questions? I do have an example but of this sort of background stuff before just showing you some code. Um, that's everything I wanted to say. So I'll like stop for a second and take in questions, and after that I'll show you an example or two. Okay? Or N is at least three. But yeah. As a, um, so one thing about Sage is we're not an institute or something, and we have very limited funding, far less than any of the MAs. So um, I would say the majority of Sage Day's workshops are what happens is somebody decides, I like to, um, I mean, just to give you a really good example, um, since our, really the best thing to do is to look at the examples of existing Sage Day's workshops. But here's one that I think illustrates nicely how it works. This is Sage Common App Days. So um, Greg Musiker, who is a, does combinatorics, and there's a lot of algebraic combinatorics in Sage. Um, those, the algebraic combinatorics people are really, really into it. Um, he applied to IMA to run a workshop there, and it, go, it works according to the rules of IMA uh, in Minnesota. But it's still a Sage day. So basically, you come up with a, we have lots of guidelines for you know, what makes a good Sage day, is what you should do or don't have too many talks and so on, but at the end of the day, often they're at other institutes. We've had several at IPEM in, uh, at UCLA. I could easily see ISERM being a good place to have a Sage Days, but I don't think any are currently planned here, but it would make sense. Um, and so basically, if you wanted to have a Sage Days at ISERM, you would write a proposal um, for something that combines doing a big chunk of Sage development with something mathematically and scientifically relevant, and you would apply to an institute like ISERV, and then they would decide whether or not to fund it. But um, if you put together a good proposal, I think it works well. For example, the Clay Math Institute funded two stage days at their headquarters. So that's an, on various number theory topics. Yes, yes Joe. Really, I, I, I think next spring, uh, There's a stage days? Awesome, there you are. Okay. So this is one of the reasons there are so many of them, because, um, uh, I mean, basically, half of them are funded by, you know, like CRM's funding this one. They're, they're funded by other places. Um, it, um, the main thing is, you know, you, you want to advertise on the Sage development list so that people know about it. There will be a lot of people who are interested in coming. Um, yeah. Uh, and let's see. If you want help as far as putting together a proposal for a particular institute, like if you wanted to do it in IPAM, we could show you all the proposals that we used in the past for IPAM. So and each place has you know different constraints. We've had a couple of things at MSRI. Um, I think this summer before last, we had one of the two-week graduate summer workshops with like 55 people for grad students, and that was the Sage days. Um, had a very large Sage component, Sage uh, programming aspects to it. Um, if you're a woman, there's there's a sequence of women in Sage Sage Days, which you may be interested in. Here's the third one, which is there's this um, really really nice large building out in the countryside, um, which we just rent the entire facility. And um, uh, Jennifer Balakrishnan and Allison Dinas are organizing this one, and this is funded by um, by uh, a little bit by Microsoft Research and a little bit by a uh, private donor who just wants to encourage more women to get involved in Sage development. And it's already, we've had two of them and they've already had a big impact. So there's those, uh, et cetera. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, 
Yes. So if you say you can't see any platform, Sage runs very, very well on Linux and OS X. We do not support using Sage natively on Windows, on Microsoft Windows. You can use it via a virtual machine that we provide, like a virtual box virtual machine. Um, you can also use it without installing anything by going to the website sagenb.org. Or I think there's a local server like this at ISERM. I don't remember the address of it. Um, you can log in using OpenID. So if you don't want to have to make an account, um, if you have an OpenID account, a Yahoo account, or like a Gmail account, you can just click here. And if you're already logged in via Gmail, you just automatically get logged in. And it uses your same credentials. Um, and then you get a bunch of worksheets. This is not, nothing here is running on my laptop. This is all running on a server somewhere. Um, and you, know, you can do this sort of thing. Should be one. So it starts up a Sage process in Seattle um, the first time I run a command. And hopefully it'll evaluate this. I don't know if it's going to take a long time or what. One problem um, as this starts up. One problem with sagemb.org is it's literally just running on one machine in the basement at the math building in Seattle. And um, it's very popular. There are almost 90,000 accounts on this. And at any given moment, there's typically over 200 people doing things on here. So it can get pretty heavily loaded. Um, I'm currently working with Google and Amazon to move this to be hosted on their services so that I can scale it up a lot more. And that's one of my main projects for the next month and a half. Um, so this is obviously not very exciting because it's not even computing anything. It's just sitting there trying to start up a Sage session, um, which is very annoying. I do have a, in case I'm giving a demo, I have demo.sagemb.org, which is running on a different computer. Since I'm giving a demo, of course, nothing will work right. So um, you can use it too if you want, though. Um, so test. So the demo server is just far less loaded than sagemp.org. There's also another um, way to use Sage, which is aleph.sagemath.org. Um, what you do is you just type in a single calculation. It, so what I showed you before was the sagemb thing is like a full-on notebook over the web. But aleph is a single chunk of code. So you, know, you, can, you can do something like this. You can, you can just do one single thing. You can click Evaluate. It'll evaluate the code, show you the output. And you can also do things like create a permalink, which is a link that when you click on it, gives you exactly this code. So people embed these in books and stuff like that. Um, as an example of that, if you just go to the sagemath.org website, right on the front page, we have, or we had, Sage Cell Server right here. So this thing you click. And this is just a collection of examples of single page code. So I don't know, say uh, graph theory, I don't know, interact, induce subgraph. So it gives you this little piece of code. And when you click evaluate, it evaluates it. And then here's what you get. And um, I, I don't understand this at all. I have no idea what this is. But apparently, if I click a button, something happens. Um, <laughs> how exciting. And then it draws some graphs. I have no clue what this is. OK, so ah, that would make sense. OK, so let's see. If I click that, does it delete vertex 9? A new, oh, right. Oh, yeah, there it is, with no vertex 9. OK, so that's exciting. Um, um, let's see, calculus, uh, computing integral, apparently. So there's this little thing like this, which is, it's nice because you can easily Im embed these. You can embed this calculation inside of another website um, if you want, um, et cetera. It's so like just on your web page without installing anything at all. You just put a little bit of JavaScript in your web page and you can have these inputs and outputs. Um, so there's that. So in other words, there's a lot of options for using Sage where you don't install anything at all on your computer. But you can install um, it on your computer if you want. Yeah. If you want to install Sage on your computer, it takes about two. So if you're using it over the web, it doesn't take any memory. It's just running in your browser. If you run it on your computer, it takes about two to two and a half gigabytes of disk space. 
yeah, it's compared. It's about the same as MATLAB or Mathematica, so it's more more than Magma, similar to MATLAB and Mathematica, um, and less than the sum of MATLAB, Mathematica, Magma, and Maple. So, but it's a couple of gigabytes in disk space. Um, but again, you're not required to install it to use it, and the usability over the web will continue to get better and better this year. That's one of the if not the main goal, as far as I'm concerned, for Sage this year, is that usability over the web becomes dramatically better. Um, you know, a lot of people use web-based services like Facebook and Gmail. A lot of people, hundreds of millions. Um, so it's not at all an unreasonable thing to imagine people using Sage that way. Um, like it's nice because you can just pull out your cell phone or your or your iPad or iPhone or something and use it that way. Okay. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, it depends on the people, it, and it depends on, the, I think, the nature of the contribution. But I do know some people will, at least um, for significant contributions to Sage, they will list them not as a publication, but as a different section on their CV and explain, you know, roughly what the size is that it was peer-reviewed. Um, but I'd, I'd, I've never heard of anybody like listing it directly as a publication, and I really think it's kind of a different thing. But still, something that should be worth, I would hope, would be worth something academically. But um, uh, it's, you know, it's not clear. Math mathematicians are um, very traditional, and um, but it's pretty hard to. It, I think it's pretty hard to sell academically a, something to be valued if it isn't peer reviewed at all. And at least with Sage, um, code does get peer reviewed. So at least you have the option of, of getting through the sort of bare minimum of what it means to do science. Um, and moreover, if the person who, so you tell somebody you have some code that you've contributed to Sage and is peer reviewed, and they'll go, what the heck does peer review mean for software? Um, a traditional mathematician would be, it would be very reasonable for them to ask that. And that's one of the reasons that we make the peer review process open. You can give them a link, they can go there, and they see exactly what it means um, publicly. So it's not something where you just have to describe in the abstract what you kind of feel like it means. So they can see exactly what it meant in this particular case. And they can judge for themselves, which is another thing I think mathematicians are good at, is making up their own mind whether something should be worth credit. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated question, though. And um, uh, often another way in which people get credit is that you know, there's letters of recommendation. So somebody might ask me for a letter, and I will look at the code they've contributed and come up with some uh, description of the value of it to the SAGE project, how much it's used, and I'll write a letter on their behalf or other people write similar letters. So that's a, a concrete way in which Sage contributions do benefit people. Um, I don't write very many letters like that, but it, um, I do write letters like that on occasion. OK, any other questions? All right, so I'm going to uh, show you an example or two. Um, let's see. Close all these tabs. All right, so here's an example of making an elliptic curve. Um, you can either give a label from the Cremona database, or you can give a five tuple or a two tuple. Um, you can make an elliptic curve. So I'm going to type the first few letters of elliptic curve, and I hit the tab key, and it extends it. Um, you can always tab complete, like you can do with many other systems. Um, so for example, elliptic curve from J will give you an elliptic curve with a given J invariant. So here's an elliptic curve with J invariant 2012. Um, there it is. And if you want to you know, copy and paste the curve into your paper, you can say LaTeX of it, and it gives you back a version that is latex -able. Um, this is the case for pretty much every object in all Sage, not just elliptic curves. It's pretty easy for elliptic curves. Um, once you have an elliptic curve, you can do e.tab, um, and you'll see all the things you can do with an elliptic curve. It's context-sensitive help. And here, here's a list. So one thing we might want to do with the curve we just saw is ask for its j-invariant. So that's somewhere, j-invariant. And you can do that, and you don't just do, if you do e.j invariant and don't do anything else, um, this is the function that would give you back the j invariant. 
So what you want to do is call that function. And there you are. So you see they calculated the J invariant not back in 2012, which is a good sign. Um, and there are many other things you can do. Um, so I'll show you some more examples with the curve of rank 2. So right here I've made the elliptic curve 3D9A, which is my current, well, for a long time it's been my favorite elliptic curve. It has uh, rank 2, those are generators for the curve. And um, in order to compute the generators, what it did was it, um, it sage links in the MW rank C++ library that John Cremona wrote, and it calls it to compute these two generators um, through a C library interface. And we also have code that is uh, in Sage for computing integral points. Integral points on a curve, on an elliptic curve, that's an example of a function that you are sort of really used to using magma, then you'd say, oh, it's there. But then before we wrote it in Sage, um, there was no open source free implementation at all of computing all the integral points on a curve. And so, you know, there you have various piece, important inputs to computing the integral points, like computing the word LA group, you didn't have the uh, rest of the code. And so, uh, actually, John Kimona and two German students wrote an implementation of integral points. And when I was refereeing the patch, I thought, hey, what should you do to referee an integral points patch? Because how do you know what the answer's right? So what I did was I just made a for loop and ran through a large number of curves using Magma and Sage and preparing the answers. And amazingly, a lot of them were different, which was kind of disturbing. Um, and it turned out Magma was missing a lot of uh, integral points. So initially, actually, Sage was missing some in the initial review. And then... Uh, I told them, and they fixed their code, and then suddenly Magma was missing some, so then we told Magma, and they fixed their code. And then uh, they decided to do a similar thing, and they found some problems with our code, and it kind of goes back and forth. So never ever trust the output of integral points in any program. That's the moral. Um, there are parameters that you can pass, like if you really, really care, and you just want to be extra certain. Um, if you look at the documentation for the function, the way you can do that in Sage easily is put the cursor right after the open parentheses and hit the tab key. That'll pop up some documentation for the function. You can also do the following. Um, uh, you can put a question mark and hit the tab key, and that pops up the documentation. Either way works. So if you look, um, there are actually, both sides. Oh, I expected, apparently in this version, it's not completely direct how to adjust the search bounds, but uh, there must be a way to do that. Anyways. Um, yeah, so this is this just illustrates integral points, and uh, there are lots of examples. By the way, in Sage, um, almost 90%, about 89% of the functions in Sage have examples illustrating how they work, and the examples always look like this. They're Sage colon, the input code, and the expected output, just like you see here. Um, and these examples are tested on dozens of different computers, architectures, operating systems, and we don't release a new version of Sage until all the examples pass. And there's well over 100,000 of these um, examples. So um, you can be pretty certain that if you copy and paste one of these into Sage that it will work. Unless there's a specific comment to the side which says optional, you know, requires Magma or something like that. Then if you don't have Magma installed, it won't work. Okay, so that's just another example. Um, here's plotting. So let me kind of do this in two steps so it's a little clear what's going on. Um, whoops. So what this does is it plots our elliptic curve, and um, that's kind of ugly. If you just, I guess, give it with no options, it'll choose a range so that the elliptic curve looks pretty. So there it is. Um, but down here, uh, here I'm plotting all the integral points on the curve. So there they are. Um, probably should combine the two. But in any case, it's pretty easy to plot stuff. Most objects in Sage have a plot method or you can feed them to the plot function. And regarding plotting, um, most 2D plotting that you could do, say in Mathematica, you can do it in Sage with almost exactly the same input. You just change the uppercase letters to lowercase and put underscores between the words. Um, 3D plotting similarly is uh, somewhat similar to Mathematica. Uh, here's another example of taking the elliptic curve. There's a change ring method. So GF of next prime 10 to the 40th makes the uh, finite field of cardinality of the next prime after 10 to the 40th, and e dot change ring gives you back the elliptic curve dot by taking this curve and reducing it modulo dot prime. And then um, if you ask for the cardinality, which uh, let's just make this and then time it, it should, oh, that's done. There. Well, that's stupid because obviously it didn't take no time. 
So oh, there it is. So it takes like a half second. This uses Perry under the hood. Perry has an implementation of the Scofe Elkies Atkin algorithm. Um, here's an example of computing the subanatic L series of the elliptic curve uh, right here. Notice that the output in this case is typeset. If you have anything and you say show of it, you get a nice LaTeX representation. And if you click on that, you can get uh, how you would actually paste it into LaTeX document, which is nice. Um, and there's many other things. Um, so uh, formal group. So F gives you back the formal group. If you have a formal group, there are various questions you can ask about it. Like F dot, if you do F dot tab, you'll see the various things you can do with the formal group, like ask for multiplication by n, the formal log, etc. And here's an example of computing the formal group law to precision four, computing multiplication by two with the formal group, etc. So these sort of formulas are just sort of built in, um, as you can see. Um, let's see. Here, here's a quick example of an interact. So basically, if you define any function and put at interact right before the function, then it will turn the function, in, it'll make an interactive um, control for each of the inputs to the function. And you can manipulate those controls. So here, you can change the slider, and it will recall the function, but with the new value for that slider, as you can see. So this is drawing um, a plot of pi of x up to that value. And this is a pretty simple example, but you can do all kinds of things here. You, um, you can have uh, range sliders, multiple range sliders, uh, uh, buttons, drop-down boxes. I mean, there's tons and tons of different things you can do. Graph theory already showed you some things. One nice thing is there's a graph editor, and you can sort of move the vertices around, see them reorganized in a beautiful way in real time. What? Can you export two graphs? Or, yeah, like a plot. So, yeah, yeah, okay, so, um, so if I make a plot, any plot at all in Sage, um, you can say dot save a dot PDF or any name you want. It'll create a PDF, which you can include in your LaTeX document using include graphics. And that PDF is a PDF version of just the plot. Um, so it's vector graphics that you can include in your document. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you can download a worksheet by just saying file save, and it'll download the worksheet as a single file. Worksheets can have lots of stuff attached to them, like metadata. Like this worksheet that I'm looking at um, right now, so just go to the very top. This worksheet I'm looking at has a whole bunch of files, images, and stuff attached to it. It has a um, MATLAB matrix attached to it, etc. And if I go file save, um, to a file, then it just gives me back a single file that contains all this stuff that I can then upload later to another worksheet. And I think I'll just finish by showing you a little um, so more plotting, all kinds of stuff. There's some 3D plotting. Um, and I'll just end by showing you. This is the this is a MATLAB image, the Yoda pose .mat, something like 53,000 vertices in a 3D model. So you can see Yoda here, <laughs> displayed in the notebook. OK, so um, that's everything. There's you know, an enormous amount you can do in Sage. There's like 10,000 pages of documentation if you want to look at it. Um, nowhere even close to done, which is the, the quick uh, summary. But uh, some things are done, and much remains to do. Um, in the sense that when students ask to do projects on Sage development, it's, there's a lot of things that used to be really easy, and there was an obvious thing that needed to be done, and now it's not so easy sometimes. Okay, so that is everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, certainly storing... Uh, I don't know, MATLAB's good for a lot of things outside of number three, and very little within number three. Um, yeah. If you, have those pro if you have one of those programs installed on your computer, then you can call it from here.
Well, it can't do everything. If it could do everything, then you might not want to bother. But even then, um, I frequently use the interface between Sage and Magma and Mathematica for benchmarking purposes because I want to see how fast those systems are. So I do a calculation with some random matrix, say, and then I want to do exactly the same calculation with the same matrix. I can push the matrix over to Magma and do exactly the same calculation. I can compare speed and I can also compare answers. Um, I found some serious bugs in the Hermit Normal Form implementation in Paris. Just basic computing the Hermit Normal Form of a matrix in Paris was completely wrong in certain cases. And I found that by making a random matrix in Sage, computing the Hermit Normal Form using my algorithm, using Perry and using Magma. And Magma was right, Perry was different, and that was disturbing. But I reported it to them and they fixed it. So um, it can be really useful. It's a lot easier to compare output when you don't have to copy and paste and figure out how to convert your input to work in that system. Because you, know, you can't remember the format in many cases, or it's just too much work. OK. All right, I'm sure I'm over time, but one very quick question. There's a mailing list. Join the mailing list and post about it. Sage Develop. There's like 1,500 people subscribed at least. Depends on the book. Somebody posted uh, solve left for a for a two by two matrices over the integers. Segfault Sage yesterday. David Loeffler, a number theorist in England, posted that one of Kevin Buzzard's past students, and it was. Uh, it looked really scary, so I looked at it. By the time I even looked at the ticket, which was an hour or so after he posted it, somebody else had figured out what the bug was, what was causing it, tracked it down, but didn't want to post any code to fix it. So I wrote a patch implementing their solution and posted that, and then it got refereed. And so this whole thing took about two and a half hours. So it depends on the thing, but if it's really, really scary, it will get looked at. Hopefully. But, you know, it's software and I don't know. There's studies that say that you know software sometimes has to use thousands of hours to find a bug, and if you're the person that finds it, please, please, please report it, because otherwise we may never know, and it may hit us at the wrong, you know, really bad situation. And by the way, if you're ever using the Sage notebook and you're like a really shy person or something, you can click on report a problem. All it does, it brings you up to a little website, and you can just type in what the bug is, and it's totally anonymous if you want it to be. So there's an easy anonymous way. It gets entered in a Google spreadsheet somewhere and then somebody periodically goes through and looks through them and um, reports those in the proper way. So if you're a really shy person, there's still a way to report a bug. You don't have to make any accounts or do anything. Just click on report a problem right here. There's a few things that are required, but your name is definitely not required. See, no star next to email. So I encourage you to use that if you are such a person. Okay, all right, thanks.